tend to think of hackers as individuals who perhaps work out of a basement and there's pizza boxes scattered everywhere and they never see the light of day. When in truth, in actuality, the average hacker is a full-time working employee at your local business. They are perhaps even high school students or college students. And so when we face something like the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to imagine that while we are basically in quarantine in our own homes, what, where is the hacker? And that's why in the cybersecurity industry, we fear that there may be more of a risk now than there was two, three weeks ago as these hackers who previously were spending their day elsewhere and hacking during the weekends and evening hours are now spending their entire day working on exploits. Here to speak with me about some of the concerns that we could raise and some of the things that we should know about the dangers of the work from home environment is cybersecurity expert, Stephen Cobb. Stephen, thank you for joining me. Well, good to be here, Robbie. Stephen, I alluded to some of the concern in the cybersecurity industry with the fact that we do expect an elevation in the threat level when it comes to cybersecurity. Right. And part of that comes from our need to work from home. There are so many different technologies that we should be tapping into and the companies are tapping into. Um, can I just give you the opportunity to kind of open the floor to you to, to discuss how these technologies can be not only helpful, but also dangerous in our organizations? Right. So um, I think as you alluded to at the beginning, the, the activity of, of what I would call criminal hacking, uh, and in, in fact, these days, I just tend to call it criminals, um, you know, criminal activity, I don't think is taking a break, uh, although uh, criminals may be working from home now more than they were uh, because it, a lot of criminal hacking is pretty organized uh, and, and you know, takes place in a structured environment in many cases. But through this disruption from the earliest outbreak news onwards, we've seen a willingness by some criminals to exploit this. And some of the first things we saw were um, using the virus as a bait to get people to open phishing emails, searching, you know, phishing emails which were sent to uh, trick people into loading malicious code uh, or visiting malicious websites. And so if we, we, we can assume, based on past experience of, of crisis situations, that there will be part of the criminal element which will try and use that. And for people who uh, are working normally in an office with an IT support group, either on the phone or down the hall, they're not as exposed necessarily to that activity as um, when they're at home. When they're at home, typically uh, a lot of employees aren't doing company work. And so, You've got this situation where people are in a different environment, potentially using technology they're not familiar with, uh, and being potentially subject to uh, attack by criminals in, in some form or another. Now, one of the things that, that's interesting about the term work from home is that it encompasses a wide range of technologies. And I think just about every organization, or every company has it set up somewhat differently. And depending on what that organization does uh, in its day-to-day -day operations, it may be more or less prepared for this situation. Right. So I was thinking, thinking the, the, my, my last employer, you had maybe 25% of people who were fully uh, authorized to work remotely most of the time. Then you had maybe another 25% who worked remotely some of the time. Uh, and then you had the rest who were mainly office-based. Uh, each of those groups had a different technology structure in some ways. The software they used to get to the company resources was different. Uh, and different levels of experience with that hardware and software. Mm -hmm. And so... For example, the sales team out in the field 
uh, they were pretty up on how to get into systems they needed to use. Uh, they were pretty savvy about security. My former employer was ESED, a maker of security software, so they, <laughs> they got a lot of training on that. But you have maybe 50% of, of the, the North America group uh, for this company. And, and you know, any typical company, I think, you've got probably 50% of the people at least who aren't accustomed to using their computer at home to do work. Yeah. I'm not talking about just dialing in to get email. I'm talking about doing their day-to-day -day work. And right. we have various technologies for that, remote desktop uh, protocol, remote access protocols, and so on. And so because this shift to work at home has come very quickly for some of these people, there's a concern, and I'm certainly not, Many, many of my colleagues in, in the profession have expressed this. There's a concern that people are not properly trained on how to do this securely, on how to avoid common pitfalls. Uh, they've left, in many cases, the workers at home now have, have left a, a kind of secure environment to do their work. And yeah. um, so I have to say there's been some very impressive work by people in the InfoSec community to provide online tips and advice to write articles and blog posts and, uh, you know, help raise awareness of this problem and mm. help provide solutions. But one of the weak links here, I think, is going to be actually IT departments themselves because, you know, they've also got to deal with this whole virus problem. Uh, in their family lives, uh, now they're being asked to shift maybe their focus of work to take on more work to support more people. I mean, if you, if you think of half a workforce at a company using technology they're not familiar with, you know that's a that's a, a significant yeah. potentially in support calls, um, and and so I think. You know, we have to look and uh, you know look at stress factors there, um, and then also we have to look at stress factors on the systems. Uh, we're seeing network I, issues. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, your your face is occasionally freezing a little bit in this conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we've seen. Uh, I'm in Europe. I'm in the UK, uh, which is still in Europe for the moment. Uh, reduction in uh, picture quality on streaming services. Uh, which companies like Netflix have agreed to, to alleviate the problem. About a week ago, a colleague in Manchester, which is a big city in the north of England, uh, said they were running 10%. Bandwidth consumption in the city was running 10% above it, what it was. Wow. I, um, you know, I'm on a potentially 360 megabit per second fiber connection. Uh, some parts of the UK have very good connections, others not so much, but mm -hmm. we're quite lucky where, where we live. But the performance of that has really been drained by jumps in uh, usage mm -hmm. and certain times of the day. Uh, you know, it used to be people coming home from work, uh, starting to watch streaming stuff at home would produce you know a buildup of demand and bandwidth and uh you know and then everybody had to slow down a little bit now you're seeing some of that during the day because you're getting this bandwidth shift to different parts of the network right so company internet connections are handled through big data centers and you know a different level of service provider from domestic and so you know, you've got the shift of traffic into networks which are not as prepared to deal with it as, you know, main providers. Uh, you know, so, so we've got a lot of these issues. What I fear is that employees who aren't you know, recently updated, shall we say, on their security awareness training. Yeah. Maybe they joined maybe the company it. three yeah. years ago. And Can, I, can I put a, a slightly different 
um, perspective on it as well, Stephen, in sure. that, you know, we're thinking in the context of, okay, so coming from a company like ESET, um, as you mentioned, your previous employer, it's a big company, thousands of employees, they, they're obviously very security conscious and they understand. Uh, right. And a lot of the folks that work there understand um, best security practices and you have training in place. But looking at our, at this shift that is a result of COVID-19 and, and the government decisions around protecting its right. citizens, um, we're talking a shift entirely from those big businesses who have 50% of their workforce working in the field uh, to mom and pop shops, to yeah. every little IT firm that normally just provides walk-in service to um, to contractors, to builders, to all these different industries that now need to still be able to operate their business, but they're they're being told stay at home. Yeah. So these are people that are not so cybersecurity conscious. They're not trained in cybersecurity practices. And and so how can we as a community and how can we as a podcast help to um, provide some advice, I suppose, to those users who are now thrust into this. Like th right. nobody saw this coming. Nobody knew that we were gonna be working from home halfway through March. Right. What can, what can we say to those individuals? So I think there are resources available. And, uh, you know, referring back to ESET, uh, they have a very good um, security awareness training program that anybody can sign up to use for free. Uh, and there are a number of companies, quite a few now, uh, that, that offer you know, the basic cybersecurity awareness training, which you know, good training lets you know what the threats are. You know, what, why is this happening? Um, so that em employees will know I like to put it, you know, the extent to which criminals will go to, you know, abuse systems, to um, steal information, to ransomware systems, that is, hold them up for, for ransom. Um, and then the things that they can do to protect. And, and, and if there was one thing I would, I would say is understand what phishing is, understand where the email threat is, uh, because that's still one of the preferred uh, methods of attack. Uh, attack vectors, as as we say. Uh, look at your email, and and it's quite interesting. One of the effects of this crisis has been, and I, I, various people have remarked about this, an increase in the emails that you're getting from people who you kind of remember, or maybe don't. I mean, clearly there are companies around the world who are emailing everybody on their mailing list. Who, or anyone they have ever had contact with uh, to say, hey, we're here to help. We're, you know, COVID-19 is making this difference. And, and I mean, some of these messages are great. Uh, and some of them are important. Some of them were for products you don't own anymore, so you're not so interested. But what you've got is an email situation, which is rife for fake emails, where, mm. you know, with potentially the offer of, Updated information on, on COVID-19, um, check the latest uh, cures for COVID-19, uh, you know, alluring uh, titles in the subject matter that people are going to be tempted to click on if those have got through their email service and their so security software. I think whether it's, it's a company decision or an individual decision, you have to be running a really good piece of security software, a security software suite on your system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Windows comes with some protection built in, but the different methods of attack and approaches of attack need to be covered by a security software suite. Um, one of the things that we see with, with less experienced users uh, and smaller companies is that they may be under the impression they've got security software because there's a logo on the desktop uh, for the product which was there from when it was installed and i can see from the look on your face that this is yeah. really well you know i hear about it all the time Stephen. yeah you know, you, oh so, yeah no it says it has antivirus yeah there it yeah, is there's the logo on the desktop for the antivirus program when you click on it it's expired 
or it's running, but it hasn't been updated in 12 months. You need to be running a piece of security software, which is constantly checking for new threats. Now, yeah. a good piece of, of information, which again, a lot of people aren't aware of, is that companies like Google and Facebook and um, the providers of browsers and internet service providers and all of the security software companies are constantly sharing a vast amount of information about these emerging threats. So if a criminal sets up a malicious website to try and trick people um, into getting infected with malicious code and taking over their system, that is detected these days often very, very quickly. And as soon as that first detection happens, it's shared around the world. And if you're running a good piece of uh, commercial security software, it's going to get that update. Your browser, uh, you know, all credit to you know uh, Microsoft and and uh, and Google and Firefox. Uh, the main browser makers are in on that. So if if somebody discovers a new malicious address, um, that's updated in the browser. So you mm -hmm. see these uh, boxes come up saying, you know, don't go here. Yeah, don't proceed. Oh, don't proceed. okay. Can I proceed? Don't proceed <laughs> when it says that. Yeah. So if, if, yes. So, so, so being careful about what you click on in an email, you know, and, and making sure that when you're looking at an email, it's legitimate or it's serving some important purpose and you know who's sending it. Listen to the things it says in your computer. Yeah. You know, if your security software says, don't go there, don't go there. Yeah. It's not okay to, oh, I'll check it out anyway. You know, it, it that alert is coming up for a reason. There are very few false uh, alerts on these systems. And, and, you know, you can pretty much guarantee that if Google Chrome says, don't go there, you shouldn't go there. <laughs> what some people, you know, some people go, but it's from my bank. Well, if your bank's trying to get in touch with you, go to the bank website, open a new browser window, a new browser tab, and, and manually go to the bank. Yeah. Can I just say, well, this is revealing some a really interesting aspect of social engineering, Stephen, which is when we realize as users, as computer users, as network users, and users of cloud services that hackers are watching for the things that people are that are going to trick people. So you're making me think, yeah, when I click on a link that's more information about COVID-19, I'm thinking, oh, well, I can, dif I can distinguish with my mind because I'm smart enough to determine whether this is fake news or if this is legitimate scientific right. news. I, I feel like, so I can make that distinction, but what a hacker will do and what a social engineer will do is they'll use those types of websites to then infiltrate a system. So it may look like it is supposed to be this, and you're talking also about banking, but it's a way for this malware to oh, get in as well. Yes. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, Johns, Hop Johns Hopkins University uh, in America has been doing a lot of tracking uh, and is, is kind of the go-to source for a lot of uh, information on COVID-19. And early on, their map, I think it was, of infections was taken over uh, or, or, or abused by um, hackers, uh, criminal hackers, to, um, yeah. So, so it's not just a question of, is this fake COVID-19 information or is this legitimate information? Is the source, the legitimate source, safe? And so, right. It could be legitimate. Like phishing scams, it could be an exact copy of right. legitimate information. So what, so what you may see in your browser sometimes is, is you've looked at a, an email, it looks legit, you've clicked, and you've gone to a legitimate site, but that site's been compromised. Yeah. Again, this background updating and sharing of malicious uh, data, you know, data about malicious activity will often catch that. So you, you, so you may be in a situation, and I think you raise a good point, Robbie. You've gone to your known source, but that known source has been compromised. 
you get a browser warning that says don't go there and you go but hey it's a legitimate place those are those are kind of transient because what will often happen is is the you know the legitimate source that's been compromised will we'll find that out fairly quickly and, and, and rectify the problem sure. but i think mm -hmm. what and this sounds really like a a, a sort of a well, it's not a happy thing to say but we can't sit at home just clicking away merrily because we're at home and we you know uh, we're not at work anymore. We gotta we gotta pass the time somehow, Stephen. Yes, but but don't do it by you know being daring on where you go on the internet. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, there are many studies over the years that show that, and I and I guess you know this would be potentially something that's not in your standard uh, security awareness. Is there's a strong correlation between certain edge behavior and infection uh, of systems with malicious code all right so uh, let's we let's say uh, adult websites now interestingly a lot of adult websites are very very secure because they know that you know they're a target and they they want to build trust with their visitors but if you're looking for stuff that's free stuff that's edgy stuff that's pirated stuff that's copyright uh, infringement, then you are exposing yourself because that is some that's an area where, uh, for, for example, we've seen this in in torrent services uh, in the past where you know, people are like, "Wow, well, I want to stream that movie. Uh, it's not available yet, legitimately, but the pirated version is available. I'm going to get a torrent player. Criminals love to infect those." Um, I'm going to you know, stream this file. Criminals like to infect those. And, right. and yes, in some way, I saw an article recently, and I, I'm afraid I can't credit the person who, who wrote it because I can't remember who it was, but criminals are ace marketers. They're monitoring the trends. You know, they're going, hey, you know, um, uh, there's a game come out recently about crossing the road. Ha, uh, <laughs> Ah, <laughs> right. And then, you know, a hot new Animal game. Crossing, I think the kids call it. Animal Crossing. Is that? Right. Am I right, so, kids? Yeah. So, you know, tips on how to win on that. If you Google right. for that, there will be an attempt going on. I can bet. I bet that the 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 strategy of what's called search poisoning is going on, where. Uh, criminals will use various methods to uh, get their search results for their site that they control um, into the top search results. Um, this isn't COVID-19 related, but about, I don't know, three or four months ago, I was looking for um, a map of the world. And right in the top 10 search results for you know map of the world, was an infected site and there's somebody you know, there, there, there's and, and sometimes when i say there's somebody doing something i actually mean an algorithm's doing something but there are algorithms which look for the most popular search topics marketing people use those for legitimate purposes but then criminals use those to find what people are looking for and right. and mm -hmm. you know when when a particular singer becomes popular or a particular actress becomes popular search results for pictures of them are a great way for criminals to get you to click on something that they control mm. so let's take what we've learned here in summary and bring it together into something that's very relevant for our small businesses, for the medium-sized business that's being impacted by everything that's going on in our world today. We've learned that hackers are smart. Hackers Crim are... Well, let's, let's make a distinction that we're talking criminal hackers because it, we, we don't Indeed. want to implicate the people who are hacking for good, right? <laughs> sure, yes. So maybe that's a generalized term at this point. So criminal hackers are smart, they are intelligent, they are good at social engineering, which means 
basically, they monitor those trends. They understand what kinds of things we're thinking about and what kinds of things we're looking for. So putting that into perspective here, Stephen, you used the example of the BitTorrent downloads and maybe trying to find illegal copies of movies and things, but maybe I'm not a lawbreaker. Maybe I'm not looking for those right. illegal things, but I'll tell you what I am looking for right now. My Google search is going to be for things like, for example, free remote desktop, free work from home software, and the social engineer criminal hacker is watching for those kinds of trends and saying, there's an opportunity for me to provide some free software. Right. Once that gets into your system, I mean, right now we're not, we're working from home. Our computers at the office in our business are basically free for all for outside attack. So I, I have one customer in particular who I'm thinking of who called me up and said, oh, I, I've got work from home settled because I installed VNC on my computer and I opened the port in the firewall. Right. So now that computer is accessible from anywhere in the world by anyone. If we need to it's not done properly, yes. And I yeah. think the point here is that if your company hasn't or your organization hasn't supported working from home uh, before and you're just setting it up now, you need to get professional advice. That's, now, that's it. going yeah. to be, you know, that's possibly going to be on the phone or online, not in person, but there you, you want to get this done properly. Um, I'll share a statistic with you, uh, kind of a fresh statistic. I happened to think about this problem back in um, the beginning of, of the month. Uh, RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, as you know, is, is one of the ways in which remote access is enabled to systems. And I, I've studied this in the past, and uh, I would refer people, if, if you don't mind, to welivesecurity.com. Uh, which is a, is a great website with security information. Just use their search to look up RDP because this is a widely used protocol which is often used insecurely. So one of the clues is that if you set it up and you can be seen by other people to be running that, that if it's clear that you've got the uh, default port for that open on your systems, um, you're probably, you, you possibly haven't done it right. Not, not every visible port is insecure, but I thought, okay, let, let me just see how many people are running RDP. Uh, and right. you can use a tool, a legitimate legal tool to do this because every very basic piece of information is every computer on the internet is visible to the internet in some way. Um, and there's scanners which look for that. March 6th, there were uh, 3 million uh, systems where the default port for RDP was, was visible. Right. I checked before our, our conversation, uh, 4,240,000. So people are That's turning really on remote desktop in order to be able to access their computers from home. Right, so, so we've seen a 40% increase in the number of visible systems running the default port for, for, for this. And, and I want to be clear, they're not all insecure, but my chances as a criminal of finding one that's insecure have just gone way, way up. I've got a 40% yeah. better chance. And, and from my own work, I know that, you know, even when there were just a million, um, you could very quickly find one or two in a particular area and, and, and this is all geographically locatable too. So, you know, if you, if you were a criminal targeting people in Philadelphia, you can find who's got their port open in Philadelphia. And if, if I can say, and if I can say, Stephen, my concern with remote desktop is that, uh, and RDP being the protocol, so on your Windows machine, turning on remote desktop, right. is simply the fact that somebody can be brute forcing your password right. and you'd be none the, you'd, you're none the wiser. So eventually they get in. And because you're working from home, you don't even realize that they're accessing your system. Can I suggest that without two-factor authentication, we should not consider any 
rem, right. uh, work from home right. software so, to be so, safe. And this comes back to your previous point. You're setting this, if you're setting remote access up, uh, whatever software you're using, first of all, it, it needs to be legitimate software and, and some operating systems come with legitimate built-in tools. There are uh, products that you can purchase, but it needs to be legitimate and it needs to be installed properly and installed securely. And that means more than a password to protect it. Now, you, you could do things like limit the number of times somebody can try a bad password, but you really shouldn't have a password based authentication remote access system. You should be using something uh, that's two factor. And by that we mean, Roy, we mean a, something which generates a code that you put in to access. And it's something you have that the criminal can't. And, and, and a lot of people are familiar. Fortunately, through things like Facebook, uh, and other sites turning on two-factor authentication, people know yeah. what it means. They know its importance. Um, you get a code on your phone, and that's something which a criminal can't do unless they've got your phone. And so right. there are ways to secure this, but and you know, you 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 can do remote access securely, but you you need to have it configured correctly, and the person who's using it needs to know the things that they should and shouldn't do while they're using that system, which got, has that capability. Right. And you mentioned just the fact that, and I, and I alluded to the fact that we're not all tech savvy. So I may not know how to set it up securely because I don't, you know, I, I do, but maybe you're thinking to yourself, I don't know how to do that. And Stephen, you mentioned that maybe we should call some professionals to help us with that. And I think that, you know, you say, well, I don't know who to call. And I think it's important for us to remember as a, a global society that we're all in this together. And that goes for the mom and pop shop that goes for the 2000 user networks. And that goes for your IT companies in your local community. No. Um, IT companies are seeing the exact same shift. We are spending a great deal of our time assisting people like you in order to get secure, safe, remote work from home environment set up. Sure. That's what we're here for right now for our community. Yeah, I, th I think the, the trusted uh, you know, managed service providers around the world uh, are, are you know, stepping up. I've seen a lot of professionals online um, stepping up, helping out and so on. I mean, one thing you could do is say, uh, you, if you, for example, use Twitter, um, you know, say anybody out there available to help with remote access, um, you know, small organization, hashtag infosec uh, would, would probably get somebody's attention. Um, you know, there, there are people, uh, I know some people who've been laid off in IT because their company's basically shutting down for a while. Yeah. Some of them are volunteering to help out. And, um, you know, we, those of us who have knowledge to share uh, are willing to share it and, and, you know, stepping up to do that. Uh, what, it, it would be good if people had the sense that they don't have to go this alone, that, that you know, if, if you've got a hardware store and you've got a small workforce that can do some work remotely, they're doing it for the first time, don't feel bad that you don't know how to do this. Um, you know, and don't feel it's, I mean, I'm not going to try and fix this piece of my house that's broken without a professional. Try and reach out and get a professional to help set this up. Uh, I don't mind admitting, I don't know how the gas boiler in this place works. I need a professional to service it. Um, yeah, I, I think we do see many examples, you know, online and, and uh, in the media of, of, of people stepping up to help. And, and I think reaching out and asking for professional help uh, is, is the way to go. And, and if you need it, if your company hasn't been doing this for a while, uh, you know, and as, as we talked about earlier, in the area of, of, of security awareness education, there are free uh, resources out there. Um, you know, if you're a manager and you want to bring people up to speed, Look online for free security awareness training for and, and check 
check it out, make sure it's a legitimate company. Uh, I, I have no financial stake in ESET anymore, but th they've got some good stuff. Um, and uh, I, I'm actually in the process of making a list of these to, to post uh, on, on Twitter. Ha to send them an email to employees. I mean, if there are employees who don't have as much work to do as normal, now would be a great time. <laughs> <laughs> to do some security awareness training, right? Yes, yeah. And yeah. I'm just going to say, I mean, we are I don't want to send mixed signals because we're telling you be really careful what you're searching for because the the criminals are out there trying to socially engineer you right. and trick you into clicking the wrong links. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide some of these resources for you that we already know are trusted and true. We're going to provide those at blog.endpointsecurity.ca and those will be uh, available to you Excellent. just to help give you a, a good head start at some free resources that are that you can just click through and uh, we'll provide some descriptive text there to help you to find what you're looking for. Very good. Stephen Cobb, I, uh, I appreciate you so much. I'm so glad to see you again and you look, yes, you're sir. looking well. Same, same back to you and, and take care yes. of yourself and your family. And um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll keep fighting on. We're going to see this through together, folks. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks so much, Stephen, and thank you for joining us this week. I hope that you've taken in some great information. Again, those resources will be on our website, um, so be sure to check those out as well. In the meantime, I'm Robbie Ferguson for the EndpointSecurity.ca podcast from Positive eSolutions, and I wish you and your families, your staff, your loved ones all the best. Take care during this time, and we'll see you again very soon. Bye for now.